what's wrong with me They say I'm not turning out the way the men would have be My mother's given up my marriage My father's given up his son The Holy One is way a woman loving women when it's said and done Short clips. I'm seeing right now we have so many participants. We have 220, so it's very exciting. Uh, but hello, my name is Emma. I'm Aunt Lute's marketing director, and I'm so glad that you all are here to celebrate Ginny's book. It's a really exciting time. Um, some things to start us off. Uh, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, as Aunt Lute Books is located on occupied Ramaytush Ohlone lands. Um, and it is vitally important that we recognize this history of this land, its colonization, and the continued stewardship of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples in our community. Um, other business things to get to before we jump in. This webinar is being recorded. Um, and so, this is so that we can distribute it later to people who couldn't make it at this moment. And that way we can also have transcriptions um, and closed captioning later on. Um, we will be including the discount code that you get for joining this event in our chat and we'll bring it up later um, as well. Um, last thing is there will be a question and answer portion of this event towards the end. So if you have any questions at any point, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom window and there should be an option to select Q&A. Um, there you can add in whatever questions you have. You can like other people's questions, however you wanna engage. And we also have the chat going for if people just wanna say hi to each other. Um, but yeah. I will pass this on over to Achi now, but thank you, everyone. Hi, everybody, can you see me? This is Achi Obejas, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Ginny's book. Um, I actually, um, I'm in the middle of nowhere in Utah with my son, Elon. Um, I actually first uh, encountered Ginny not as part of Bolivia, but as part of the Furies, I had just moved to Bloomington, Indiana, 
it was the late 70s and um i was having my first really intense lesbian relationship um with a, a woman named diane and the very first night we were together um she played chris williamson's the changer and the change both sides um i didn't know Ginny was involved with that at the time but like two or three days later turn out she had been subscribing to the furies and she had uh maybe three or four issues and i found them in a stack of stuff to read that she'd like laid out up by the couch and i began reading and the name that constantly stuck out for me was Ginny. I was always moved by her pieces. I was always stimulated by her pieces. I always wanted more. Um, and then many years later, um, at that point already well acquainted with Olivia and well acquainted with what was then women's music, um, I began working for a one artist label in Chicago and there was some conference and we finally met from what I recall. And I, I know that everybody who was dealing with women's music was always like starstruck by Meg Christian and Holly Near and, you know, Maggie Adams and Margie Adams and, and like Alex and all those people. But I was starstruck by Ginny and uh, uh, because she's a thinker. And she's also got one of the warmest, most dazzling smiles of anyone I've ever met in my life. So I made it my mission to become friends with Ginny. That was my goal. Um, I, I was reading through this book uh, the last few days. And the other thing that struck me is how very radical um, Ginny's beginnings were, how very intensely rooted um, in so many different movements and so many different kinds of thinking and experiences um, she brought to this idea of Olivia Records. You know, I wasn't always um, taken by the music of Olivia Records, that's my confession. Um, although there are albums that I hold really close to my heart, um, but I'm kind of promiscuous when it comes to music. And at the time that um, a lot of these things were coming out, I was busy listening to Ruben Blades and Willie Colon and other things. Um, but one of the things that always really struck me about this project that was Olivia was how very ethically rooted it was, how it was very much about an idea and about an incredible faith in our ability to change the world. Um, and it inspired me to want to do things to change the world. Um, and reading through the book, there's so many times when Ginny talks about changing the world. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't sound hokey. It doesn't sound, it sounds real because, well, it was real. And Ginny and Olivia and women's music did change the world. Um, however, you want to measure it. Um, I love that the Fury's house has a historical marker on it. That's like, that really got me. Um, I actually, when I read that part, I actually put the book down and just took a deep breath because that's, that's a history that's crucial and important. And the fact that it's, it's not being forgotten, that in fact, it's being commemorated, that people who know nothing about women's music will stumble upon this and go, well, what is this? Maybe they'll be, you know, motivated to, to want to find out more. Um, I, I lived in Chicago most of my life. It's only been in the last five or six years that I've been in the Bay Area. But I stayed in touch with Ginny um, all those years after we 
met through women's music and when she was at Olivia and one of the since my goal was to be friends with Jenny uh, every time I was in the area I would give her a call and we'd go out and we'd have coffee or we'd have lunch or dinner or whatever so I you know I I heard stories during the tail end of Olivia and then during her years at KPFA and then during her years with all this other radio work and community work that she's been doing and always it's been a really um it's always a fascinating conversation it's always um a truly astonishing conversation but in part it's always astonishing because Ginny is so astonishing and she's always doing things that are for the good of the world and for the good of humankind and for the good of women and I don't know when, but at some point I started saying, girl, you gotta write this down. You just, you have to write this down. And the reason it seemed important to write it down is not just because here's a fascinating life, which of course it is, it's a fascinating life. Janice is just a truly stunning at life full of adventure and love. And, you know, it, it, it pro progressive, activity and achievement and it's a life of lifelong friendships which is also just amazing um because the women that she was involved with at olivia continue to be in her life and continue to be friends with her but it was also her life was a very crucial sort of parallel line to lesbian feminism and the history that she can talk about as a witness and as a doer um, is not a history that is available to everyone. And I was always sort of terrified that, that it would go away and somebody else would write this story that some academic, at, you know, I don't know, McAllister would pick up the ball and write this thing and then it would be full of theory and unreadable and the it would be neither personal nor political and uh, so when she told me she'd gone into the workshop with judy gron to uh try to get this memoir done i was thrilled out of my mind because i knew that this story would be told um judy a very early collaborator with the furies and um Olivia and Ginny, another lifelong partnership of Ginny's. Um, so I'm not going to go on for much more. I just wanted to sort of try to put this in perspective. Um, I love this book. I'm so happy that it exists because it sounds like Ginny. It's Ginny's voice in these pages. Um, but it's also uh, the story of so much more than Ginny, which is, you know, let's face it, so Ginny. Um, and um, I'm thrilled to be here to introduce the book. And I'm thrilled to be here to introduce my friend, Ginny. It's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Achi. Thank you. So I could tell, I'm going to, I have to tell a story about you now, just a very short story. Uh, was in Chicago in the early 2000s. And Achi said, there's a guy um, who's going to speak at a church and he's running for the Senate and we should go hear him. And so we did. And it was, there must have been, I don't know, 40 or 50 people in this church somewhere in Chicago. I don't know the city well. And it was, of course, Barack Obama. So um, I don't know. I just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, um, I, I'm so excited to be here. I can hardly sit still. I can hardly contain myself. I'm so grateful to all of you for coming, and I'm so honored um, that you all showed up. We wanted, had wanted to set it up so that everybody could see everybody, and I could see all of you, but there were so many people that signed up that we, we needed to do it this way. Um, so that's how we're doing it. But I have to, like, it's really a book. It's a book. It's really a book. It's got pages and it's got a cover and it's, uh, it's really a book. And I, I want to just start by thanking um, Aunt Luke Books, my publisher, 
it's quite um, something to say, my publisher. Uh, and I want to really um, urge everyone to go to their website, buy many books, my book, everybody else's book. There's, they have published books by people that many of you have probably heard of, like Audre Lorde and Gloria Anseldua, Judy Gran, Melanie K. Kantrowitz, lots of other folks you may not have heard of. Um, but this is a, a feminist institution and um, it, they've been around for a long time. And we need to support always the institutions that, um, that share our values and that make it possible for us to express what it is that we want to say. So, um, so thank you to Aunt Lou. Thank you to all of you who, when you registered for this, made a donation to Aunt Lou. That, that will help. And, um, you know, like Olivia, Aunt Lute is a labor of love and you can just, you can just feel it. Um, so the book has about two pages of acknowledgments, which I will not repeat here, uh, but there are two people who made really important contributions, but only after the book went to press. And I just want to name them. And they are Irene Young, who took the photo of me that's on my brand new Facebook page and website, and Lisa Abbott, whose um, tech expertise and kindness guided me through the creation of my Facebook page and my website. I wanna give you a little backstory, which Achi has just referred to. Um, before Olivia, I was part of a collective of women called the Furies. This was in Washington, DC in 1971 and 72. There were 12 of us, and we lived and worked collectively. Our primary work was um, developing a political theory of lesbian feminism. And we wrote about it in a newspaper that we cleverly called The Furies. Uh, and it had a significant impact. It was distributed nationally and it, and it really had um, a significant impact and apparently still does on the lesbian and feminist movements. The Furies was a very important part of my life and my uh, political development. And the Furies was really a gateway for me to Olivia Records. Um, it was not my intention to write about the Furies when I started writing my Olivia book, but in this memoir writing class that I took with Judy Gron, I was telling the story about how as a member of the Furies, I had uh, had an assignment to go organize Meg Christian. And you, you all know how, you may not know, but that didn't exactly work out that way, um, work out that I got Meg organized. But most of the people in the class had never heard of the Furies. And so um, it became clear that I needed to write a chapter about the Furies, and that is chapter two. And because the Furies was so important to me, I wanna acknowledge, um, I wanna acknowledge the women who are here today who were part of the Furies, just say their names. Um, and they are Kalita Reed, Tasha Singer, Lee Schwing, Joan Byron, Helene Harris, Charlotte Bunch, Sharon Devey, Nancy Myron, and Jennifer Woodall. I also wanna tell you that there's a documentary coming out about the Furies. It should be out, I don't know, fairly soon. It's really quite good, um, done by Jacqueline Rhodes. So um, keep your eyes open for it. Um, you know, the Furies and Olivia Records were unique in many ways and also not, because um, we were part of a movement for the liberation of all women in general and lesbians in particular. And our movements were connected to the liberation movements um, that have been going on in one form or another for centuries in the US and throughout the world. So we were really another link in a long chain of radical, progressive, political and social activism that continues to this day. Before I start reading, I want you to meet the other olives, as we called ourselves, who are here today. And when I say your name, would you just make sure if you haven't done it already that you click on the raise hand icon in the lower Zoom window so that Emma can find you. And we're gonna start with Meg Christian and then Jennifer Woodall, who was also a fury. And I'm gonna, just gonna wait, um, there's Jennifer, and Judy DeLugach, and Kate Winter, Linda Tillery, Liz Brown, 
Sandy Ramsey, Mary Watkins, Sandy Stone. Uh, so hello to all of you and thank you for being here. And um, I guess Linda isn't here yet. Okie dokie. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to read for a bit. Uh, oh, you know what else I want to say? I know that there are also quite a few women uh, on the call today who were Olivia distributors. And I just want to salute you all too. So then, so now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to read for a bit. And then Mary Watkins is going to play for a bit. And then I'm going to read some more. And then we're going to do some Q&A. Then I am probably going to just pass out. Um, a lot of what happened and a lot of what we did at Olivia was hard and um, painful and controversial. And I write about all of that in the book. And a lot of what we did was great fun and really full of joy. And of course, we were surrounded by such wonderful music. We had some great times. This is my party. And so what I'm gonna read today is about, uh, is from the joyful parts. Um, but I assure you that I tried to cover everything in the book. So I'm gonna read, but first we have a little treat. Take it, Emma. No more, no less than a songbird On the stage, on the wire Under the lights No more, no less than a songbird Help me to make something beautiful tonight Help me to make something beautiful tonight Help me to make something beautiful tonight Hey Jenny, um, I am so glad about your book and I wish I were there in person to be there for the book release party, but oh, what a weird year. Um, I know there are people there for you. I'm there for you. Uh, I know that there are a lot of other songbirds besides myself who are so grateful for what you did to help Olivia fly the way you did. Um, I'll never forget those early days, Virginia. Um, precious to me. Um, I am really, really proud uh, of all you've done. Um, and I just, from this songbird to you, thank you so, so much. Have a great party. Ah, thank you, Chris. Okay, the book. Uh, I am going to start at the beginning uh, in the prologue to the book. And I'm going to be skipping around and Sometimes I'll remember to tell you where I am and probably sometimes I won't. It's a cold night in December 1977 at the Oakland Auditorium in Oakland, California. Intermission has ended and the crowd of 2000 has quieted as the band begins its set. The band is all women. Everyone working on this show, the stage manager, lighting designer, sound engineer, sign language interpreter, promoter, producer, childcare providers, and the entire crew is a woman. And at the end of the show, everyone will be paid. There are two long sets, actually uh, two long sets per half, uh, per half, actually four short sets each. The four short sets are performed by Meg Christian, Teresa Troll, Pat Parker, and Chris Williamson. The band is led by Linda Tillery, whose newly released album we are celebrating. She's backed by Alberta Jackson, Jereen Jackson, Chris Hansen, Vicki Randall, Diane Lindsay, Colleen Stewart, and Mary Watkins. It's the second night of this sold out event. The first night was billed as especially for women, but even on the second night, there are far more women than men. Tickets went for 450 and were sold in women's bookstores all over the greater Bay Area. The concert is wheelchair accessible, which is not the norm in 1977. 
This was an Olivia Records event and all these women recorded for Olivia. Olivia Records was a national women's record company founded by a group of lesbian feminists in Washington, D.C. in 1973. We were determined to change the music industry, but more than that, much more than that, we were determined to change the world, to overthrow the patriarchy and capitalism, to end racism and imperialism, to create a world where peace and justice and equity were not just words, but were righteous ideas to be embodied inside ourselves and fought for in the world. Feminism was not a laundry list of issues for us. It was a different way to understand and use power, to benefit the whole, not to advantage the few. Yes, we wanted a lot, lots of things on that laundry list, and we wanted more. What we did would prove to be important. How we did it was just as important. As I stood on the back of this concert hall on that night in December, I believe that this show, with these black and white women on stage, with these women of all races and backgrounds working behind the scenes, was another step on the road towards our lesbian feminist revolution. We had big dreams, some might say ridiculous dreams, in what seemed like very dark and dangerous days. Richard Nixon was stirring up fear and resentment towards black people, college students, and anyone who didn't agree with him. The war in Vietnam was still raging and thousands were dying. J. Edgar Hoover was using the FBI to infiltrate and help destroy radical political movements like the Black Panther Party, and who knew who else? We had a vision that we held on to tightly and expressed constantly in every way we could. We made big mistakes and we learned from some of them. We kept moving. We had our hearts broken and we kept going. We were lesbians and we did the unthinkable. We centered our lives on women. The story people were told in the 1970s by the government and mainstream media about women's lib, as they insultingly called it, described the movement as a bunch of white middle-class suburban women who really just wanted their husbands to help more around the house. But there was a part of the women's movement of the 1970s that was visionary, revolutionary, anti-racist, and very grounded in women's real needs and aspirations. We understood that culture and politics were not separate, that each was informed by the other, and when consciously united, created a much more powerful force for change. We were going for hearts and minds. We did not want a piece of the pie, which we considered poisoned, contaminated by greed and the need to dominate. We wanted a whole new pie, filled with love and justice and with enough for everybody. That is the spirit in which we created Olivia Records. This is the spirit behind this musically disjointed concert we produced in 1977. This is the story I'm about to tell. So uh, Meg, Christian, and I were lovers. Meg found Chris Williamson's first album, which was on the Ampex label in a bargain bin. And there's a you know, much more detailed story about this in the book. And when Chris came to DC for a concert, we met her and we invited her to dinner, uh, to come to our house for dinner. And we were all a little nervous about it. We all tried to cover our anxiety in our own ways. Meg drank a lot of wine. I acted tough and disinterested. Chris immediately started doing yoga poses on the living room floor. Within five minutes, she was doing shoulder stands and planks and lunges. I don't think we had ever seen anyone do yoga before. She talked about energy and vibes. Chris kept saying that in California, the leash was a little longer than in Washington, DC. We thought she was one of the strangest people we had ever met. We hung out for several hours, eyeing each other warily and talking about nothing of consequence. We made a tuna noodle casserole for dinner, which was something we ate pretty regularly. We didn't want Chris to think we were anything but cool, so we didn't want to appear to be trying to impress her. We definitely succeeded in not impressing her, and the tuna noodle casserole later became the butt of much joking from the stage by both Meg and Chris. Just a few weeks after that bizarre dinner, we met up again with Chris. Our friends, Chris James and Cheryl Smith were part of a feminist radio collective called Sophie's Parlor, which broadcast from the radio station at Georgetown University. When Chris and Cheryl decided to interview Chris Williamson, they invited Meg and me to participate in the interview. 
So on a spring afternoon in 1973, we all piled into the small studio at WGTB and found our places around the table. Mics were set up and adjusted. The interview began in a low key fashion with some typical questions about how long she had been performing, how did she write, etc. After we all loosened up a bit, we started making jokes about women's tap dance companies and women's puppet shows. We asked Chris about her experience with Ampex, and she spoke of how frustrating it was for her to have had so little control of the process of making the record. And then she said, why don't you start a women's record company? And that was it. I knew immediately what I was going to do. I did not have one second of doubt. After that, I talked to everyone I knew about starting a women's record company and invited them all to join. The 10 of us who had met in January showed up and Meg and I presented the case for a record company. By the end of the meeting, we had agreed. On that night and over the next few months, we began to outline a set of basic principles that would guide us. We created a set of documents elucidating our vision, our strategy, and some rules of the game. The preamble said, this record company was started by lesbian feminists to provide a means of equalizing economic cultural inequalities which exist in this country. We believe that women and therefore lesbians are oppressed by the heterosexual and capitalistic institutions already in existence. And we are committed to finding ways within the company of alleviating class, race and heterosexual privilege. Because women have been denied the means of communicating their music and their culture, we intend to seek out and encourage women's musical achievements. Finally, we are committed to producing quality recordings of quality music. And then we listed all the departments, how they would function, how they would interact with each other, how women would be hired and fired. We established a grievance procedure, a salary structure, a method for handling disputes. We insisted that all meetings would be held during regular working hours and that all financial records would be accessible to everyone. We would operate collectively. We would work exclusively with women. We would treat all women with respect. We would record music that celebrated all aspects of women's lives. We would operate with transparency. We would not create a hierarchy or star system. We believed that all work was valuable and should be equally compensated and honored. We wanted to create an alternative economic institution that would eventually enable us to control all the means of production and to employ hundreds or thousands of women in well-paying jobs, doing meaningful work with opportunities to learn new skills and to become part of the decision-making collective. We would be as non-capitalistic as possible. We believed we were acting with integrity from a set of feminist values that we all subscribe to and were living to the best of our abilities. I believed that we would create a model for feminism that would be irresistible. Women who worked with us would say, this is what feminism looks like, I want in. It never crossed our minds that knowing nothing about making records would be a problem. <sighs> Okay. How y'all doing out there? I know you can't, I can't see you, but I can feel you. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead now to the summer of 1974. And we are in the process of making Olivia's and Meg's first album, I Know You Know. Meg had asked Chris to produce the album with her and I was trying to keep everything within a rather paltry budget. So how much time we spent in the studio was an issue. Um, the Joan that I refer to in the story is Joan Lowe, who was an engineer and was really critical to us in our early days. And unfortunately, Joan passed away before the book came out. So Chris was staying with us in our extra bedroom. And one morning, late in the process, she asked to talk to me privately, something she never did. I approached her with wariness. She put her arm through mine and walked me into her room, shutting the door behind her. I want you to stay home for a few days. Don't come to the studio. She was not asking, but she was not pushing either. When you're there, you watch the clock and Meg watches you watching the clock, but she needs to be in the music, not in the budget. Any doubts I had about Chris dissolved in that moment. It was not easy to make demands on me or to stand up to me. Chris knew I didn't really trust her. 
I had wanted her to come out on stage and I wanted her to be more overtly feminist and political. There was also what I thought of as her Californianness. She was so airy and I was so earthy. She believed deeply in spirit and I was a committed materialist. More than that, I was very protective of Meg and this record and the whole record company. This baby wasn't all mine, but I had a very big stake in it. I thought her telling me to stay home was incredibly brave, and she was letting me know that she was really shouldering her responsibility as album producer, that she wanted this record to be as good as it could be, and that she was going to take care of Meg. I understood this immediately and felt enormously grateful. There was no argument. I wrapped her little body in my arms, held back my tears, and said, yes. But after a few days, I was needed back at the studio. During the summer, when Meg and I were in San Francisco on our cross-country trip, she had performed at the Full Moon Coffee House. This was a small venue that held around 50 women. We had decided that for the album, her song, Ode to a Gym Teacher, should be recorded in front of a live audience so that we could capture the exuberant laughter from the audience. Full Moon was chosen because it was close enough to Oregon so that Joan could drive down with her equipment and do the recording. All of that worked well. But when we listened in the studio, we realized the audience was too small, the response too tepid. We needed to find a way to fix it. What we really needed was a new audience, one that hadn't heard the song before, and we weren't likely to find that in DC, where Meg had been performing gym teacher at every gig for months. And we didn't have time to book a concert someplace we hadn't been, get Meg and Joan and the equipment up there and hope for the best. What else could we do? we decided to create a laugh track. I'm a good laugher, so I was called in. There were probably 10 of us in the studio. All the Olives, except Meg, friends we'd invited, Chris and some of the musicians who played on the album, including Margie Adam. Joan played Meg's recording of the song over the speakers and mic'd us laughing and sighing and carrying on as if we were there at the full moon. I had never noticed until this moment that some people laugh out exhaling and making noise, and some people laugh in. They inhale when they laugh, so it might as well be silent. Unfortunately, we had a couple of in-laughhers. We ended up doubling and tri tripling the laugh track until we finally felt it sounded like a large and raucous audience. I hope I have not shattered any uh, anybody's uh, belief about the the recording of Ode to a Gym Teacher with that story. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break now. Mary Watkins is gonna play a song. I wanna tell you a story about Mary Watkins, however, before we go to Mary. For several years in the late 80s and early 90s, I, would, uh, I attended the Michigan Women's Music Festival and I worked as the production manager on the acoustic stage. And the, um, the, the festival would close on Sunday night. We would do a candlelight, uh, moonlight concert at midnight or something ridiculous. We all should have been asleep. Oh, but we were younger then. We didn't have to go to bed so early. And um, it was beautiful. We would put luminarios on the paths and candles all over the stage. And I approached Mary and asked her if she would do a song uh, for the concert. And she said, yes, she, well, she, you know, Yes, and how, how much time did, I ha did she have? And I said, I don't know, like four minutes. And so it was her turn to go out. She went out on the stage, she sat at the piano for you know 20 seconds. And I believe that she then channeled this incredible piece of music that lasted exactly four minutes. That is just a little piece of the brilliance of Mary Watkins, who is gracing us today. It's yours, Mary. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm so excited and honored to be part of this uh, event, and congratulations for your new book. Uh, the piece I'm going to play today is called Remember the Love.
Thank you, Mary. That was beautiful. Emma, you need to uh, turn on my camera. Um, you know, um, okay. Mary is, um, I mean, we could, we could spend the rest of the time we have together talking about some of the things that Mary has done. Um, she's written several operas. Um, one about, um, oh, I'm not gonna remember all of them, but she, Mary's just, it's just, a, it's just a great privilege of my life to have to know Mary and to have worked with Mary and to sit with her music, just let it just go through. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna tell a few stories now from the road. Remember when we used to go on the road? Remember when we used to be able to leave the house? Oh yeah, okay. So, so now we are uh, going to the uh, National Now, that's the National Organization for Women Conference in Philadelphia in October, 1975. This both was and was not a big deal. On the one hand, this concert would expose Meg and Olivia to women who probably didn't know much about us, but could become important contacts for future concerts and record sales. On the other hand, we believe that NOW was a reformist organization whose overarching goal was equality with men. We were a bit dismissive of them. We thought their aspirations uninspired and weak and their programs were puny. Nevertheless, being asked to be the main entertainment at the National NOW conference meant that somebody on the conference organizing committee was aware of women's music and Meg Christian and that was a good thing. And so we went. The conference was held at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, which became famous a year later as ground zero for the first outbreak of Legionnaire's disease. The concert was supposed to begin at eight o'clock after the election of officers and board members. Now was going to open the concert to the public and our Philadelphia distributor had done a lot of publicity to make sure that the larger lesbian and feminist communities would show up. But the election of officers did not go according to plan. In fact, we later learned that it was one of the most bitterly contested elections now ever had. Meg and I were told that we would be called from our hotel room when they were ready for us, and so we waited and waited. About once an hour, someone would call up to our room and let us know how much longer they thought it would be, and they were always wrong. Meanwhile, we heard from our distributor that there was a line of several hundred women outside the hotel waiting to get in for the concert. This was Meg's first concert in Philadelphia and women were excited to hear her and be part of this large gathering of feminists. And so we waited and waited. Meg was playing her guitar. I was distractedly watching TV. Around 11 o'clock, we decided we needed to do something. It was becoming clear to us that this concert was not going to happen. Meg put her guitar down and said, I feel terrible about all these women waiting outside for hours. I, I know I said it's too bad there are so many of them or we could have them up to our room and do a concert here. And then we both got it. <clears throat> I jumped up and said, let's go out on the street to the line where they're waiting. Maybe you can do a couple of songs. Meg put her guitar in its case, wrapped around a scarf around her neck to protect her throat and we went down into the street. We asked the women at the front of the line to let the women behind them know that Meg was gonna sing for them right here and now, and they should come in close because there was no sound system. I explained what was happening inside, that we doubted if the concert was ever going to happen, and that this was the best we could do. And so a hundred or more women, all that were left from the four hour wait, gathered around, and for 20 minutes or so, Meg gave them a piece of the concert they had come for. She ended with Ode to a Gym Teacher, and everyone sang along. This was a moment of grace. Our dreams for Olivia, our vision for the world we wanted, our capacities to rise to any occasion, and the love we felt for and from the women in the street, everything seemed perfectly aligned. Another story. In Pittsburgh, the concert was at the YMCA and the women's community was legally blocked from holding it as women only space. The room was packed with close to 200 women and maybe two men. I was sitting behind the mixing board watching the crowd and I noticed one of the concert organizers standing in the back of the room crying. I approached her cautiously with no idea what could be wrong, but a lot of anxiety. She tried to staunch the flow of tears, 
but instead she started sobbing. Look at this, she blubbered. This is my community. This is the first time I've seen us all together. I'm so happy I could cry. Oh, and then she started to laugh. I guess I am crying. Last one, Salt Lake City. We had amused ourselves for hours with stories about Mormons and lesbians. Will they run us out of town? Will we, <clears throat> excuse me, will we inspire a rebellion and run them out of town? Will we turn into pillars of salt? We were actually a little nervous about the concert. Will anybody come other than the three women who are producing it? In a rare moment of extravagance, we decided to go out to dinner. We chose a restaurant on the main drag and we were shocked to see that every single person eating dinner was a woman. Had we stumbled upon Salt Lake City's secret lesbian gathering place? The women didn't really look like lesbians. They were all wearing dresses and seemed a bit frumpy, but still, maybe this was what they had to do to survive under the watchful gaze of the Mormon church. Alas, we learned when we met up with our hosts that this was not a secret lesbian restaurant. There was a big church meeting that night and only men were allowed to attend, so lots of wives took themselves out to dinner. They didn't show up at the concert, but over 100 brave feminists and lesbians did. Meg and I left Salt Lake the next day and did not look back, just in case. Um, before I, I uh, as I started to write the chapter about making um, the Changer and the Changed, Chris Williamson's first album with us. I told a story about the second album that Chris made with us <clears throat> called Strange Paradise. I had been on the road with Meg and when I got back, Judy DeLugach immediately, Judy DeLugach was uh, coordinating Strange Paradise. Judy immediately pulled me aside. She said, we're halfway through recording and Chris won't sign the contract. We have already spent a small fortune on this record and we can't afford to stop but we can't go on until we get an agreement with her. For the first few Olivia albums, I had written all the contracts. I knew absolutely nothing about contracts or contract law, but I believed that our written agreements with each other should reflect our feminist values. These contracts were short and without many demands and probably completely unenforceable, but we never had to find out. Now we were growing and had hired Boo Price to be our lawyer and write our contracts. I was shocked when I read Boo's first draft. It was pages long and protected us from dozens of possibilities and contingencies that I hadn't even known existed. This was close to the version of the contract Judy had been trying to get Chris to sign. I went to the studio and asked Chris to talk to me. So what's the problem with the contract? I asked her. Look, I am a table and you are a chair. She really said this. We have different roles, she went on, but we work together. We fit together. This contract makes it sound like we're enemies about to rip each other off. It does not have the energy of how I want our relationship to be. You are a table and Olivia is a chair? I often felt like Chris and I came from different planets. She said, do you trust me? Do you really think I might steal the master tapes and give them to another company? Okay, I said, understanding on a deeper level than ever before that Chris was not going to fly away. I get it. So let me rewrite this. I think there are really three points we need to formally agree on. We own the master and the performance is on the record. You own the songs you wrote and we'll get all the songwriting royalties and you will get royalties on every record we sell. Is that it? She stuck out her hand to shake and then pulled me in for a hug. Write it up and I'll sign it. Now I'm gonna go make some beautiful music. And she did. <clears throat> this is the beginning of chapter 18. This is what it was like to be gay in the 1970s in most of America, even eight years after Stonewall, the insurrection that marked the beginning of the gay civil rights movement in the US. If you were lesbian or gay, to your landlord, you referred to your lover as your roommate or your friend, or he could evict you, if he had even consented to rent to you in the first place. If your employer found out, you could be fired. Your parents or your husband could have you committed to a mental institution. And until 1973, homosexuality was considered a mental illness and was included in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders created by the American Psychiatric Association. In a custody battle, you were sure to lose your children to your ex-husband, no matter what kind of derelict or degenerate he was, 
as long as he wasn't gay too. It was assumed that you were a sexual predator who enjoyed having sex with children. You did not hold your lover's hand in public and you certainly didn't kiss her or show any other kind of affection publicly. If you subscribed to gay periodicals, you made sure they were delivered to you in a plain brown wrapper. The left accused you of indulging in bourgeois individualism that would hurt the cause. Parts of the women's movement accused you of introducing a lavender herring into their agenda and hurting the cause. Some men, including policemen, thought it was their prerogative to rape lesbians to punish them for daring to prefer women to men. Others thought all a lesbian needed was a good screwing by a manly man and she would come over to their side. There was so much more. Many of these things are still happening. In spite of all this, people kept coming out, writing and publishing books, performing music and comedy in concerts and on records, opening coffee houses and bookstores, health clinics and community centers. There were music festivals and legal defense funds, print collectives and land trusts. And there were myriad ways to find and connect with each other, newsletters, call centers, and lesbian rap groups. In 1977, there was a woman named, I'm sure many of you remember, Anita Bryant, who was um, a spokesperson for Orange Juice. And she founded a campaign called Save Our Children. Uh, and she started organizing opposition to the burgeoning movement for uh, lesbian and gay civil rights. For the most part, none of the attacks even acknowledged the existence of lesbians. We were, after all, just women. And besides, nobody could figure out what lesbians did in bed. How was it possible to have sex without having a penis involved? Regardless, we understood that we would not be exempt from the results of these campaigns. We knew we had to act. We just didn't know how. And then over lunch one day in the Olivia House, during a discussion of Bryant's latest outrage, Jennifer Woodle said, well, we're a record company. We should make a record. And so we made Lesbian Concentrate. You know, you just don't know how the, I don't even know what to say about this. It's just, of course, we, it's just brilliant. I don't know. I mean, you know, these things just come in and they come in because it's what we're supposed to do. Okay, I think this is the last um, piece that I'm gonna read. Uh, yeah, okay, it's kind of long though. Okay, here we go. In retrospect, so much of our strategy was ridiculous on its face. We wanted to get past the defenses and into the hearts of straight women everywhere. We believed, at least for a while, that if they could just hear the music, they would leave their men, march in the streets, and stand with us as we overthrew the patriarchy. So we tried with great seriousness of purpose to gain access to and attention from radio stations, record stores, top-notch nightclubs, and taste-making music reviewers. At the same time, we were openly contemptuous of the radio stations, record stores, top-notch nightclubs, and taste-making music reviewers, and were doing everything we could think of to render them powerless and irrelevant by building up alternative feminist institutions wherever we could. It's no surprise that we didn't accomplish these goals and that we drove ourselves a little crazy in the process. This chapter could be called by one of two aphorisms we invented and liked to bandy about. Process is our most important product. This came to me from an ad for General Electric, which said, progress is our most important product. Or, struggle is hard. That's why we don't call it fiesta. This was Jennifer's. Between March 1975, when we arrived in Los Angeles, and October 1977, when we moved to the Bay Area, we released seven albums. I Know You Know, The Changer and the Change, Bibi Karoche, Where Would I Be Without You, The Poetry of Pat Parker and Judy Gron, Teresa Trull's The Ways a Woman Can Be, Lesbian Concentrate, Meg's second album, Face the Music, and we were in production on Linda Tillery's self-titled album. We had published songbooks for I Know You Know and Changer. We were distributing albums by Kay Gardner, the Berkeley Women's Music Collective, Joanna Kasdan and Cassie Culver. Our artists were touring pretty constantly and we were booking the tours, road managing, and usually conducting post-concert workshops. Our distribution network had grown to over 60 women and they were selling records in big and medium-sized cities and small towns all across the US and Puerto Rico. 
We were in New York and Pocatello, Albuquerque and Vermilion, South Dakota, Chicago and Chico, and lots of places in between. Needless to say, our original group of five, Jennifer, Kate, Judy, Meg, and me had grown, but our principles of working non-hierarchically, making decisions collectively, and valuing all work equally remained in place. Remember how at the beginning I said that how we did things was as important as what we did? So we spent a lot of time processing. We processed everything. We released Linda Tillery's album on December 1st, 1977. Leopold's, the great independent record store on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, reported that sales were brisk and that they were seeing lots of black women come into the store to buy the record. Leopold's wanted to set up a big in-store display and they thought they could sell a lot more if we would partner with them on some ads. In particular, they wanted to buy time on KRE, a local R&B radio station with a large black listenership. KRE was already playing the album and we understood that there would likely be even more airplay if we advertised. What could we have possibly found to object to? My concern was that we would be sending customers to Leopold's and not to the women's bookstores. Of course, we hoped that Linda's album would reach a new audience that didn't know Olivia Records or women's music and that this would be their portal to lesbian feminism. We also knew that it was the women's bookstores that gave us shelf space and sold our concert tickets and played our albums all day long in the store and were built on principles much closer to ours than to Leopold's. We didn't have to spend two days deciding to do the ads with Leopold's, but it was another example of the way we struggled with every decision, the way we insisted on looking at every side of every issue and understanding the choices we were making and the consequences. One more story. We were producing concerts in Oakland and Berkeley in halls that sat anywhere from 2,000 to 3,400 people and selling out all or almost all the seats. We sold all our tickets as general admission, no reserved seating. So when we opened the doors, hundreds of women and a few men made a mad dash for the best seats. I wanted us to consider selling reserved tickets. I wrote this in a 1978 memo to the collective reserved tickets seating at concerts. The main advantage of this is the avoidance of stampede when the doors open for general admission concerts, that people don't have to come three hours early to stand in line to get good seats, etc. The disadvantage is that she who has money early gets a better seat than she who has money late. There are several ways to do it if we want to. One is to charge one ticket price but just sell reserved seats. Another way is to charge different prices for tickets and have all the prices mixed up. I mean, the most expensive seats would not all be in the front and the cheapest seats would not all be in the back. However, probably then someone who was buying a ticket late would end up paying more money for not such a good seat. Third alternative is to have the best seats be the most expensive, etc. This is a drag. The decision on this day was to continue to sell all seats as general admission, although eventually we did change to reserve seating. But we tried to put every action and decision through a feminist lens. For us, that automatically meant considering race and class. Under these circumstances, it's astonishing to see how much we accomplished. Processing everything collectively was exhausting, but it was also exhilarating because we were actively and consciously living out our values in a community of women. I am gonna stop reading. Um, there's much more in the book and um, of course, and I hope you'll buy it. And um, Emma is gonna tell you how we can do that. And uh, I think you, you can go to the Aunt Luke website and use the code Olivia and not, shake your head yes emma if i'm said doing it right and and you can and you get 20 percent discount um and it's also in the chat she's just put it in the chat and so now i think it's time for some q and a yes i'm gonna i'm gonna help out with that and i can read the questions um we are running a little tight on time so i don't know that we'll get to all of the questions, but I want to thank you all for submitting things. And if you want to try to last minute send some things in, you can uh, in the Q and A button 
at the bottom of your Zoom window. But hello, I'm Emma, my pronouns are she, her, and I was here at the beginning of this, if you all were coming in late. Um, let's see, Ginny, I think a question came into the chat earlier. Can you talk about the early decision to move from Washington, D.C. to L.A. and how that impacted or benefited Olivia? Sure. Um, it was very hard to be a lesbian feminist record company in Washington, D.C. in the early 1970s. We had to, we had to get, uh, I think we ended up having to get our record mailers, uh, because we were doing a lot of mail order from Tennessee. I mean, it was just, there was not a very vibrant mu music community in DC at that time. And um, Meg and I uh, took a trip we, uh, in the summers. I had a job as a, a, a teaching Spanish to kindergartners and first graders. And so I had the summer off. And so I would book these, t these cross country tours for us. And um, in the summer of 74, we uh, took a trip to LA and, and really were, had been thinking that maybe we needed to, um, to move. The, the record industry, at that point there was a record industry and it was basically located in three places, Nashville, New York, and uh, Los Angeles. We didn't wanna go to Nashville. We did not really think that would be a good place for us. Um, uh, first, I don't know why we decided against New York. I think it was too, we were all, so many of us are from the East Coast. I don't know, we decided we should check out in LA. So we went to LA and met with um, every uh, le lesbian and feminist organization we could find, including Lesbian Tide and many others, and asked them, would we be welcome here? Would this be a good place for us? Would we be stepping on anyone's toes? And everyone was very enthusiastic. And so we came back to, to DC and said, we think we need to move. And um, at that point, there were, Jennifer and Kate had been living in Albuquerque, um, and there were uh, three other women um, who had stayed, who had been part of Olivia at that point, Helene Harris, Lee Schwing, and Cynthia Gare, and, uh, and they did not want to move. And so they left, they said, you know, it's right, you should move. And so Judy and Meg and I uh, packed up the truck, and drove, and Jennifer and Kate packed up their car and we drove to LA and that's how we moved to LA. And it was, it was the right decision because we needed to, I mean, there's a whole story I tell in the book about trying to get um, I Know You Know out and the difficulties we had because we were in DC and the pressing plant was in LA and we were not communicating well. So that's the story. Yeah, well. I mean, that kind of leads, someone else was asking uh, if Olivia Records struggled with other record companies, or do you think the original idealistic business model could work today? They say, I feel like we need Olivia Records now. Oh, you know, um, I think we need so much now. <laughs> we need we need so much now. Really, we need. If you haven't voted yet, we need to vote. We need to make sure um, that you all vote. Um, you know, it's it was a very different time, and the and there was no internet, and there there was there um, there really wasn't a way to get music out. Um, except by making a record and now it's much easier to get music out and of course there's 70 bazillion people doing it and so it's easy to get lost in the crowd i think we need we need to i mean what i said at the very beginning about aunt loot and the need for us to support the institutions that share our values and to be thinking in terms of creating the institutions that will support our values and to be really imagining what is the world that we want to live in and how do we get there and to and to make it every day you know and we make it by how we live um, and how we treat each other and where we spend our money and um, so uh, could we, I don't think we could have another Olivia. I certainly would not do it today, but you know, I'm a, a little older and I don't have as much energy. It's a different time and I think we need different things. Mm. Yeah, encouraging for my generation, <laughs> little. 
Well, there is, there is encouragement for your generation. The encouragement for your generation is that you have imaginations. You know, don't let your imagination be limited by what you see. You have to, you have to let it go. You have to think about um, what, I mean, you have to start with, what do I want? What do I, what kind of a world do I want to live in? And what keeps me from being there? And obviously, there's a whole lot of things going on externally that you can't have a lot of impact on. Um, but you can, you live your life and how you treat people. And we're, again, the th things I just said, I'm not going to say them again. Where you spend your money, all that stuff matters. It all matters. And what you put out matters. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna to hop to another question. Um, can you talk a bit about how writing this book has impacted you? Um, I loved writing this book. That's the first thing I wanna say. Uh, it enabled me to um, really get, first of all, I had to, because I had to talk to so many people who were involved in one way or another. Um, uh, people that I haven't talked to in a long time. So it, 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 it enabled me to reconnect with a whole lot of people. And that was, uh, that was exciting. And that's still, that's still going on. Um, uh, it enabled me to fill out the story. Um, because I had really, a, 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 I had been living with my own story. And by talking to people, um, I was able to fill out the story with you know details that i didn't know because i didn't remember or i wasn't in the room at the time um, but also their perspectives um, the other thing i would say is um it just um it reminded me again of how um how important it is to uh, to really uh, develop a vision. I, I mean, I just keep saying this over and over, but you, you, it, you're not, we have to make change. And in order to make change, you have to know what you want. And you have to let your, just let your, let, you know, radical imagination is what we need. And, um, and it really um, reminded me of that. And that made me happy to connect with everybody and to remember this. And also I have to say that some of it is really hard. Some of it was really hard to write. It was really hard to live through. Um, there was a lot of what felt like betrayal um, by individuals and by um, groups of, of our own community. And that was very hard. It was hard to go through that again. And it was also in a, in a certain way it was healing. So. Did you keep a journal? Or no, really I didn't keep a journal, but what I, you know, I, what I did was we didn't have computers, we had typewriters and, and I kept copies of, I made carbon copies of all the letters that I sent and I saved a lot. I did. I saved a lot of letters that, that people wrote to me. So I had all of that. And then we had, um, uh, we had, I think weekly collective meetings and we took extensive notes and I had all of those and I had, um, I just had a ton of stuff. I had date books. There's a story that I tell in the book um, that uh, about a meeting that we had with Yoko Ono, which I'm not gonna go into here, but nobody remembered this story. None of the other olives remembered the meeting with Yoko except me, but I had my little date book from 1974 that had the date in it when we went to meet with Yoko Ono. And that's another story. You have to buy the book if you wanna know that story. <laughs> yeah. Good, thank you, as the marketing director. <laughs> Tactic. I'm gonna hop to another question. We only have room for like a few more. Um, why do you use the word lesbian rather than queer, LGBTQIA plus? Okay, um, that's a good question because a um, couple of reasons. So, you know, first of all, uh, in the 70s, not that different today, but in the 70s in particular, lesbians were pretty invisible. And uh, there, was a, there was a gay movement and the focus of the, the attention, whatever attention was given to the gay movement was given to men. And it was very important for us to um, put women at the forefront and to say, um, we are not the same as gay men. We don't do the same things. We don't act in the same way. We have our own movement actually. Um, and we are lesbians. The other thing is that 
lesbian, the term lesbian was a, a derogatory term. I mean, it was used as a derogatory term. It was a very, it was a, it was a derisive term. I mean, if, if you knew some man and, and he wanted to have sex with you and he, you didn't want to have sex with him, he would say, what are you, a lesbian? Like, that, that could be the only possible reason you wouldn't want to sleep with him. But it was such a put down. So to call ourselves lesbians and to call ourselves dykes was a way of reclaiming those words and saying, yeah, you bet. That's right. I am a lesbian. You got it. So that's why. Great. That's a generational thing. I understand that now there's a reason to say queer and LGBTQ, but don't forget the women. Mm. If you were starting Olivia again today, what would you do differently? Would you do anything differently if you were starting over again? You know, we used to say, um, if we knew then what we know now, we never would have done this because it w would have seemed impossible. So the short answer is, um, I guess what I would say is, uh, I don't even know how to think that way, but I would, what I would say is no, I wouldn't do any, I would, I would do everything differently and I would do nothing differently. I would do everything differently because I'm, you know, 45 years older and I have a lot more experience and a lot more, I hope, wisdom. And so if I were to transport my, my current, this, my current spirit and mind and heart and uh, into that time, I, of course I would do everything differently. But the fact is that that who we were at that point, we did the best we could with, with what we knew and to have changed anything could have changed everything. And in spite of the, um, the mistakes and the stumbles and the, um, the controversies, um, we did really good stuff. I mean, we really, not just Olivia, but certainly Olivia was part of this movement that, that built community and that um, enabled women to, encouraged women, made space for women to come out and be who they are. And, you know, that's what liberation is about. It's about, it's about all of us being able to be our full human selves. So I, I don't know. The answer is yes and no. Yeah. Someone's asking, why did you pick the name Olivia? Oh, so there's a whole long story about that in the book too. But briefly, um, Meg had found, we couldn't come up with a name. We had all kinds of really stupid ideas. And then there was a book that Meg found that was called Olivia and it was by Olivia, which was a pen name for somebody whose name I, I can't remember, Dorothy something. It's in the book. Um, and it was a, I just don't remember. And it was a, it was a, it was kind of a love story. And we thought, okay, she suggested it. And we, we all thought, okay, that's good because, um, um, it's mellifluous, you know, Olivia, it sounds like, it sounds musical. So we went with it. Yeah. Cool. Um, maybe, maybe this will be our last question because it's looking forward. Uh, now that this book has been achieved, what's next? <laughs> I told you I'm going to pass out. That's that's what's that's what's immediately next. You know, um, I I work for a wonderful organization called um, World Trust, and we do um, uh, racial justice and, and racial equity and uh, um, uh, social justice workshops and films, and uh, and that's what I do. And um, at what's I don't know what I just keep going, putting one foot in front of the other. I will never stop working for justice. Um, I will never stop um, loving women. Uh, I will never, I will never be satisfied until we are um, in a much better place as, as, as individuals and as, um, as a culture and as a world, as a, as a race of people. Human beings are challenging, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Jenny, so I, after this, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to chill for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Jenny, you're such a hero. It's such an honor to be in this Zoom room with you. 
Um, thank you, Emma. Thanks again to Aunt Luke. Thanks again to all of you who um, came and um, stayed and uh, and over the years, if you were there, supported the music and came to the concerts and did the work that, you know, I'm very clear in the book. I, this is going to be the last thing I'm going to say. I'm very clear in the book that we were not alone, that there was a lot of stuff going on, that we were, and that, as I said at the beginning, we were part of a movement. And, um, and we just, we just um, have to keep moving and we will. And thank you all for all the things that you have done to move that along. Thank you. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Just to close this out, I will reiterate the discount code. If you wanna purchase the book now, it's available. Uh, just go to antloot.com and use the code Olivia. Uh, we should be putting this in the chat right now and it's been in the chat a few times. Um, there's also an option and we're throwing this in the chat to fill out a Google form just to, if this is Aunt Lute's first virtual event and so if you want to share your opinion or if something really upset you, if you really liked the virtual experience, please, we really appreciate your feedback. It helps us so much. Um, and yeah, thank you all for attending. Oh, also I do wanna mention this chat I don't know if Ginny, you've had energy to look at it, but like, it is so sweet. You all are so wonderful. I'm gonna save it so that hopefully I can distribute it later to you all um, along with the recording. Cause I think it's really tender to see this community engaging. Yeah. Oh, great. I, I wanna read it too. Yeah, I, I'll send it to you after this. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. Have a good Thank one, please vote.